Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure update. It's the 11th of April. As always, we have the chapters, so you can jump to any particular update you care about the most. New videos this week. I updated the introduction to the AZ900 course because there's new resources available. I'm going to just go into those. I did update the benefits of using cloud services, the high availability and the scalability unit of the course because there have been some changes there. And then I created a video on the model context protocol. Think of this as USB for services, knowledge, tools, your AI app may want to connect to. And it takes away all the specifics of those particular platforms and their APIs, making it really, really easy. I also did a LinkedIn article version of that as well. So on to what's new on the compute side. So there's now a new backend that I can use for durable scheduling purposes for my Azure functions. So it's got new storage built on SQL database, and it's really designed for those more stateful, longer running, complex apps that I need to run in a serverless capability. Either some event that triggers it. Maybe it has to fan out and then fan back in again. Maybe it has to wait for some kind of input. Maybe there's whatever that may be, but I need to maintain some longer running state. Well, now there's this new durable scheduler. And it does include full monitoring and management just out of the box, making it really easy to use. On the networking side, so for Azure Front Door, remember that provides that global balancing and caching for layer seven applications. It uses any cast. So the IP is available from all the points of presence around the world. It does split TCP. So I terminate my session at the edge. And then it goes and establishes the session to whatever the origin is, either thing providing the service. So that's working for internet based communications. Well, App Gateway provides a regional resiliency. We'd often put an App Gateway into multiple instances of our services within a region. And the App Gateway, again, is a layer seven, but it also can be both public facing or private. So if it's private, it uses a private endpoint into my virtual network, so there is no public access to it. Well, if I now have that app gateway with a private endpoint in my VNet, it can now act as an origin, i.e. a place the Azure front door can go to to actually go and communicate and fetch traffic as part of that Azure front door configuration. So Azure front door is facing the internet, global balancing, and now my regional private app gateway instances can actually be fronting the services that ultimately Azure Front Door is making available to the internet. Additionally, Azure Front Door has some enhanced server variables now in GA as well. So if we think about, as we have these communications, there's various uh, request and response headers, and maybe even specific request query string values. What it's going to do is now take those values and put them into server variables. Server variables can now be used in the rules engine of Azure Front Door. So now as part of my rules, I can use those values to maybe make routing decisions, maybe perform modifications as that traffic comes in and goes out. So at the Azure Front Door edge, I get a lot more granularity and flexibility to route and manipulate the traffic. The Azure Bastion developer SKU, remember that's the free SKU that provides me, in a way, a managed jump box to communicate to resources within that VNet. So it's free, so it's a lot more scoped down in capability compared to the paid SKUs, really useful for dev test scenarios. But now that free Bastion developer SKU is now available in a lot more regions, 36 in total, making it available to more dev test scenarios, where, hey, my VNet lives in one of those regions. Now I can put a free Bastion developer SKU in there to give me that nice managed access. On the storage side, so Azure NetApp Files, which uses NetApp filers in Azure data centers to provide various tiers of file service, NFS, SMB, and dual. Well, it now has file access logs in preview. So these new logs give a lot of detail around the file access activities. So it will be the, the identity performing the access, 
the type of operation and the timestamps. And that applies for SMB, NFS, and the dual protocol volumes. And remember, whenever we think about good security, we always think about we need signals. And with the signals, that enables us to make better decisions, to be able to detect if there's anomalous behavior. And so with these file access logs, it's additional signals that we now get so I can help improve the security, in this case, of my Azure NetApp files. On the database side, so Postgres SQL Managed Database Flexible now has Fabric mirroring in preview. Remember, Microsoft Fabric uses that Delta Parquet One Lake universal storage, and then they re-architected all of the different data analysis and even database engines to run off of that Delta Parquet format, so I don't have to constantly be transforming data and copying data to use for the different types of interactions and notebooks I want to use. Well, now the data I have in my PostgreSQL Flexible can mirror into that Delta Parquet One Lake, so now it can be used by all of those engines that sit on top of One Lake. There is no extract, transform, load step I have to do. It is a near real-time replication. Obviously, it's not completely real, but there's a little bit of time lag there, but it's very, very small. An initial snapshot is created and used to populate when I first turn this on, but after that, it's gonna replicate as the transactions to my PostgreSQL actually occur. For SQL database instances, I'm gonna to convert to the hyperscale tier. Remember, hyperscale separates out the compute and the page servers so I get better scale, better performance. Well, that conversion now has far less downtime compared to what we had previously. It also gives better visibility during the conversion and I get better reporting. And again, I can do this through the portal, CLI, PowerShell, REST, T-SQL. So the downtime element should now be less than a minute. Uh, previously, that downtime could be uh, between six and 30 minutes, depending on the size of the database. They've also increased the log generation rate I'm allowed as part of that migration timeline. So what that's important for is if I have a very high transaction source database, well, before potentially I could hit those log generation limits. Now they've been increased, I'm gonna have a much higher success rate if I do have a high transaction type database. And I also now can pick when to actually perform the final cutover instead of it just doing it at some seemingly random time. So once it's in a state ready to perform the cutover, I pick when I actually do that to experience that one minute of downtime. And you have that within a 24 hour window where I get to go and pick that. SQL Server running on Azure Virtual Machines now has this IO performance analysis capability. So what it lets me do is identify the IO bottlenecks related to, could be the virtual machines configuration, it could be the disks, it could be caching. And what it's gonna do is I get a nice green check mark if everything's okay. If there is some performance issue, if there is some latency issue, it's gonna give you the specific reason why, where it is, so you can then go and resolve it. Cosmos DB, um, no SQL, I can now self-serve, enable the all versions and deletes change feed. So, so that's only for my no SQL accounts. Now I have to have enabled continuous backups on the account, and then by the features blade, I can just go and enable uh, that change feed. So that's gonna give me a record of every change to the items that make up those accounts. And then, Cosmos DB for MongoDB, um, the vCore based, I can now very easily connect Power BI to that. So what it's gonna let me now do is for those MongoDB vCores, I'll be able to use direct query mode from Power BI that lets me go and interact with the live data um, sitting within there. So that's a really great capability. Miscellaneous, so Copilot in Azure is now GA, so that's my large language model generative AI powered assistant is available to help in those interactions via the portal. Now this is free. I can use it for many different types of interaction. The exact level of interaction does vary based on the specific feature and what those specific resource providers and teams have done so far. 
but it can help with optimizations, it can help with troubleshooting, it can reason over multiple resources, it can help me make decisions about what I should use. A networking team, for example, they've added a lot of specific capabilities around, hey, it can answer questions based on the docs, it can give you architectural guidance, it can answer questions on your topology, your connectivity, even security analysis. There's disk performance troubleshooting has been added specifically, but it's going to continue to grow. But that uh, co-pilot capability is now GA. Azure Backup Threat protect Protection is now in preview. So this is using the threat detection capabilities into Azure Backup. It's being integrated with the Defender for Cloud. What this is doing, it's assessing the health of your Azure Virtual Machine Backup Recovery Points. So I'm using Azure Backup. I'm creating a recovery point, point in time views of my VM's state and data. And what it's doing is it's looking at signals related to those recovery points to detect if there's ransomware in there so I can go and act and correct. And the carbon optimization capabilities of Azure have been enhanced. This is all about giving you visibility into the emissions data related to the services you are using. Uh, the subscription reader role now has access to this data. There's expanded quotas for the interactions I can do via the APIs. I can see the emission type, uh, the emission data rather by resource type. I VMs, I could see it for. There are new resource types, there are new location filters. So just better ways to go and interact uh, with that data where I'm trying to understand what is my environmental impact of the services I am running. And that is it. Uh, as always, I hope this is useful. Um, I'm actually super excited for the video. I don't normally talk about the next video I'm gonna do, but the video I'm recording this Sunday is something I've been working on for months. And it's kind of a cool thing. And so hopefully you'll enjoy that video. Uh, until next time, take care.